Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives, episode 77. If you see the big cheesy grin on my face, it's because I'm so excited about this episode. Uh, I'm Heidi Kuda. I'm with High Fidelity Jim Stewartson. We are an investigative show about disinformation, and the guys know why I'm smiling. We have a very, very special guest, John Mattis, an investigative reporter, uh, an attorney, somebody who spent five years exposing the Iran-Contra scandal, and he survived. And what a banging interview we have with him coming up. What do you guys have to say? Metal, metal, metal. I don't know if there's metal. He, I mean, brass bullocks all day long, man. Like, <laughs> hey, walking it. Walking into that fucking pile and coming out the other side alive is yeah. insane. You know, it's just sad. It's sad that it took, you know, 25 years to, or 30 at this point, to uh, tell this story correctly. But thank God for our friend Jack, uh, Brian, and uh, um, Jack, uh, John Cryer did a great job. Yeah. And John Dallas is a fucking badass. So this yeah, we all like this. And we are. Just, go ahead, high five. I would just like to point out that we have interviewed back to back American heroes, whether they'll accept that title or not. But we had, you know, Sergeant Aquilino Gunnell last week. Now we've got John Mattis. These are people who have helped change the course of history. So. Yeah, we have a good batting average on interviewing heroes. We interview international heroes. I'll add Paul Conroy, all the Pauls, Paul Conroy, Paul, Paul, uh, you know, Nyland, Paul Mason. Uh, there's just so many people who come on the show who are doing the good work of fighting fascism on behalf of democracies wherever they live, whether it's Ukraine, UK, America. Aren't we lucky? And speaking of here, and of course, we are talking about john and jack series lawyers guns and money and uh episode seven just dropped um yesterday uh and so if you haven't listened to it please listen if you haven't listened to the series binge it and then watch the mattis interview so you can see that the network that he was exposing uh in the 80s is still the network that we are fighting today our viewers will not be surprised but that might be surprising to some and just a quick little shout out speaking of American heroes. I'm holding up my signed copy of The Cult of Trump. I got to spend time with Dr. Stephen Hassan last week, IRL, and I have an incredible interview that I'm going to be dropping later today with him. But boy, is he an inspiring human being. And I look forward to uh, including more of his teachings um, in my writings and on this show. And Jim, I know you have a lot to say about Dr. Hassan's work. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he uh, I, I found him almost immediately because I realized we were dealing with, um, you know, the largest cult uh, in American history. Um, and my first thought was, holy shit, how are we going to help these people? How are we mm -hmm. going to fix this? Because they were obviously being, you know, weaponized and hurt. And I didn't really... At the time, the psychological components, how it, you know, how it all actually functioned, and this is 40 months ago, right. um, you know, I sought out the, some, somebody to help, and my goodness, um, he's, he's a national treasure. He needs to be heard much, much more, because he's the man in the world who has the most experience yes. helping people exit authoritarian, authoritarian cults, and yeah. that's what we're facing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, yeah, Dr. Hassan's a, a personal friend and a hero. He's so important. Yeah, I when I finished that meeting, I remember texting you guys, that was the best hour and 46 minutes of my life. I'm not sure it was hyperbole, like it felt so profoundly important. All right, so what do you say we get this party started and we jump into Front Loaded? Front loaded. All right. So we are going to start with the court documents, the 48 page document from Judge uh, Tanya Chutkin 
Uh, she wrote, it is well established that the First Amendment does not protect speech that is used as an instrument of crime. And that's not all she said. Obviously, she is the judge and one of the one of the judges and one of the millions of cases being brought against Trump. But why I wanted to start there is because, as you guys well know, uh, the First Amendment is used by those trying to overthrow our country as a cloak that they hide behind. And I'm going to repeat it. She said it doesn't protect speech that is used as an instrument of crime. But that's not all. I recommend everybody read uh, her very, very important 48 page document that was just filed two days ago. Uh, the reason being that she actually is already setting this up as armor in case it makes its way to the Supreme Court. But one of the things that she noted as she was quoting some of our founding fathers is if one man can be allowed to determine for himself what is law, every man can. That means first chaos, then tyranny. What a way to start the show. I hope you guys have taken a look at what she's done. And uh, if you want to chime in, go ahead. So the rule of law is taking an incredibly, incredibly long time here. Uh, and we are on a timetable, obviously, with the 2024 elections coming up. Uh, I do hope it grinds exceedingly fine, uh, mm -hmm. because if any vestige of this... You know, Trump is the cult figurehead. If the figurehead is left standing, um, we're really screwed. And even if we do eliminate the figurehead of this cult, uh, it will continue to operate. We kind of need to take the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, yeah, I, honestly, at this point, um, I am I'm deeply concerned about all the focus on Trump. He's a fucking propagandist. He's just another chewing on propagandist who happens to be the cult figurehead. He is not the guy running this. He's not the guy figuring out these narratives. He's not the guy driving us to the Fourth Reich. He doesn't understand that shit enough. The, the people who actually run this cult are the same people who did January 6th. And this, this focus on Donald Trump is dangerous because it's allowing all these other guys to continue their work, to continue to erode um, our, our civilization. And honestly, I'm, I'm a little tired of uh, Donald Trump uh, entirely. I understand, which is why our interview with John Mattis is so incredibly important because we expose the network behind uh, such uh, assets as Trump. However, he is the one who has been stress testing our constitution as that asset, as that useful idiot. And the last thing I'll say is that Chetkin quotes George Washington, who talks about obstructions of people like him, cunning, ambition, unprincipled men will be able to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government if we do not stop him, them. So I'm very glad that we have someone like her writing uh, uh, memos like this to remind us of what the fundamentals are of our democracy. So indeed, there are just there are there are public servants remaining in the government who do their jobs. This lady is doing her job, and it should not honestly be you know breaking news that somebody in the government is doing their fucking job, right? Yeah. Um, I, I again, I, I, I'm not discounting the that it's good news, that it's a good story, that Donald Trump and, and all of that. But dear God, why are we why is this guy being allowed to drag this thing out like this? Our justice system broke. Yeah. Despite well, I the fact that we still have some some patriots remaining, uh, you know, in government. And to answer your question, Dr. Stephen Hassan, it's because we've been infiltrated, which we will be talking more about at length. All right, so uh, that was awesome. Now let's get to Front Loaded 2, America, if you're listening. A timeline of the LGBTQ plus bans in Russia. So I'm just gonna give you guys a quick little rundown here. 
2006 to 2013, regional bans on LGBTQ uh, plus propaganda among children. All right, 2013. Federal ban on LGBTQ propaganda among children, 2021. So this is all the bans that occurred in Russia and the timeline. And as you look at that list, you see the local, the community, the federal, peak denunciations, more propaganda, uh, bans on non-traditional sexual relations, leading up to the ban on legal and medical transition 2023. And then at the request of the Russia Supreme Court, they are now uh, the community, the LGBTQ movement and community is now an extremist organization, which would explain the uh, raids that occurred uh, over the weekend in Russia um, of gay clubs. And this comes courtesy of a report found by Monique Kamara of Europhile. I point it out because it's a playbook. And if you don't see what Ron DeSantis and these other folks are doing, then you're not paying attention. And uh, we often say it can't happen here. Yes, it can. It is happening here, state by state. And I just want people to be aware of the playbook so they know where to put their energy as they fight the fascist creep. So that's uh, a very important story that I wanted to bring to everyone's attention. Uh, I think there's there's a there's a super important note in here, right? Which is these guys are trying to turn us into Russia. Yeah. Like seriously. Like think about what the 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 ideology, the language, the bigotry, the scapegoats are all the same. Yeah. Right. We've now we've now normalized globalists. Right. We're we're talking about the the uniparty and the you know all of these things that are directly out of Alexander Dugan and Vladimir Putin's uh, lexicon. Mm -hmm. And and all of this, all, all of the restrictions, all of the hatred, all of the fascist policies come right out of Putin's fucking mouth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the un, still the untold story across all of these, you know, things that are happening uh, is that, you know, we're under attack. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that more later, but Good. Um, I'm fucking tired of, you know, our feckless government and military, you know, not helping us fight back. Uh, I couldn't agree more, you know, um, and I'm glad you're going to be talking more about it. And because I like to end front loaded uh, talking about some of the things that are occurring that are hopeful, hopeful and helpful. George Santos is out. That's, uh, you know, long overdue, but it did happen. Moms for Liberty are being ex exposed for being uh, hypocrite, hypocrites, as we talked about last week. Uh, one of the founders is gay or bi, and we know that they often use fear of uh, homophobia and different as their gateway to do their fascist bullshittery. And Moms then, what's that? Moms for threesomes. Moms for threesomes. Or moms, for, moms for libertines, as, as Hi-Fi would say. There, there and, somebody, said, somebody said moms for liber, liber three. <laughs> liber three. Good one, too. <laughs> I do love the cleverness. I'm sure you guys know that I've been calling Mike Johnson little dainty. Little dainty as he delivers. Little dainty troll. Little dainty as he delivers his fascism. Uh, you know, satire dude, for me. Dude is, dude is just in a in a in a religious closet, and it's yeah. very very sad. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like the fact he's trying to you know destroy. Really I, fucking I actually, dangerous. He's incredibly fucking dangerous, and I've yeah. also figured it out. Mike Johnson needs to be a men's tailor in his own little shop somewhere because I can see him with the measuring tape around his neck. Measuring men's inseams and enjoying himself. <laughs> um, that's what Mike I, needs to do. Sorry. I, I came up with Maybe little dainty. Speaker inseams. I like it. I came up with little dainty because Napoleon went on the record saying that he believed he was ultimately defeated by a cartoonist who nicknamed him Little Bony and did all these really, uh, you know, 
hardcore satire, you know, very, very directed, direct hits on Napoleon. And it was called Little Boney, Little Boney. And I just thought Little Dainty would be good for him. Um, so, but in all seriousness, uh, the last few days, uh, I also, with some help from some friends, exposed some of Linda Yaccarino's links to Trump and, uh, you know, uh, her being in his administration, working with people like Herschel Walker and Mehmet Oz. And um, the only reason we know any of the stuff we were just talking about is because of independent reporting. Soon as Santos came on the scene, I immediately tracked down his uh, connections to Russian oligarch Victor Vexelberg. Uh, nobody's been probing Linda Yaccarino in the way that they need to. And it's very clearly when you just take even a cursory look that her family has connections that put her in a uh, mob deep. Uh, you know, family, a sister who's a director at Deutsche Bank, uh, another sister who only follows uh, all the extremist accounts on Twitter, who, um, you know, is some somebody that, you know, is worth probing as well. And uh, so this is a long way around to say, thank you for supporting independent journalism. Without it, I think we'd be much more in a world of hurt. So that is my front loaded for today. Why does it matter, High Fidelity? Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Why High Fidelity? First story this week. We're going to talk about AI is coming for your kids. That's right. On different high schools, on different coasts of the United States, one in New Jersey and one in California, uh, deep fake nudes of underage girls have been making their ways around schools. Um, now, right now, as you can find out if you read this article, um, only six states view uh, deep fake pornography or child sexual abuse material as a crime. Four states allow for the civil cases uh, to sue the generators of the crime. And President Biden has signed an executive order stating that uh, AI companies need to uh, watermark and control their output. Mm -hmm. However, no actual uh, laws have been passed. No regulations have taken form. Uh, when we have seen AI meetings in Washington, D.C., they are generally peopled uh, by the people who would be regulated by this law, which gives one pause as to how effective it will actually be. And that's why it matters. I mean, look, uh, Mike Flynn, Mike Flynn wrote an entire book on weaponizing AI, right? Um, this is this is a genuine threat. Um, and it's a threat to the next election in a very serious way. Um, we have to be aware that we're on this exponential curve with um, certain components of AI right now, which is making it possible, making it possible to um, create content that is effectively undetectable uh, from, you know, the source. Um, so we're, we now have a different level of disinformation that we're going to have to worry about. Even if we have a video of something, we don't, we're not going to know if the video is real. Um, so this, this ultimately, we will have to get to a place where it is illegal or at least actionable to take someone's image and make some different thing come out of it. That, that it should be illegal for somebody to take Heidi's face or my face or Hi-Fi and make them something, make that say something that we would never say. Uh, it happens all the time. People take my words and twist them and cherry pick them and do all kinds of shit to make me say stuff that I would ever say. Um, once, once people have the ability to generate imagery and video that and audio that will do that, we're in a different world. So we're going to have to deal with this. I just want to say that Hi-Fi has been talking about watermarking this content for a long time. So I feel like at least someone's listening, even though we're not quite there yet. 
I do wish they'd hurry, though. All right. Next story this week. We're going to talk about when Dublin hit the DSA. And this has to do with uh, the fact that in Ireland recently, um, Twitter promoted the far right riots in Ireland. And this comes from a number of disinformation experts who are pushing very, very hard uh, for this to be addressed. And of course, we know um, that the EU instituted the Digital Services Act, which requires platforms to be responsible uh, for their content. Of course, Twitter did not adhere to this. So we'll be interested to see how this plays out. But I would like to remind everyone already that what else is uh, Twitter being investigated for? Why Elon Musk's inability to censor disinformation about the Israel-Hamas war. Um, if you don't understand, it's a $44 billion PSYOP cannon that is being, I mean, that he is torching money to fire information warfare weapons at people. Uh, why there isn't more aggression in pursuing what is obviously an, an element of warfare that is being waged across the globe, I have no idea. And that's why it matters. Indeed. They, they, we're, we're just fucking letting it happen. And we're not even being honest about about it. Right? Right. That That's, you know, be one thing if if it was at least being acknowledged so that people could defend themselves. Yeah. Uh, but it's not. So and, we'll and, I would, and I would argue there's not a lack of ability to police that site. There is complicity in furthering the disinformation. But as long as, as long as Linda Yaccarino can whitewash it, all is well and good with the world. Also, by the way, who's showing up at all those AI meetings? Who, who funded OpenAI? Who's got this fucking Grok thing, right? Elmo. Also, you know who else uh, funded OpenAI? Oh, hi. Thanks for checking in. I'm still a piece of garbage. Puffins. Puffins. Not, Puffins. not when I'm drinking my coffee and laughing. I, that's dangerous. Yeah, anyway. if, if people don't see the, the network of corrupt billionaires uh, behind a bunch of these problems that are occurring in civilization across the globe, well, uh, maybe they should watch more of our show. The our, real deep state. The, the deep state exists. It's just not who you think it is. Exactly. All right, final story this week. We're going to talk about, once again, Ohio's the heart of it all. But this is some good news. Because a grand jury has indicted the former state public utilities chairman, a fellow named Samuel Randazzo, or as we know him here in Ohio, Sammy Dazzo from PUCO, right? The Public Utilities Commission of Ohio. Um, why is Sammy Dazzo so important? Well, we know that Governor DeWine was warned about uh, Mr. Randazzo's ties to First Energy which is accused in the largest bribery case in the history of the state of Ohio. Almost $63 million uh, went to different Ohio GOP members around our state. And isn't it funny how Samuel Arandazzo, who was referenced uh, in text messages and emails to and from DeWine as, that's our guy, Sammy Randazzo. He'll be great. Um, he had a whirlwind rise and made, oh, gee, $4 million from First Energy right before taking <laughs> the head of Puko. Uh, yeah. If you don't see the corruption, and here's the problem, right? It isn't just Ohio. As we pointed out on the show multiple, multiple times, you have Florida Power and Light. You have Alabama running dark ops against the people of their state. You have collusion with journalists within states. Uh, ops are being run. Look, obviously power companies are one of the vulnerabilities being exploited to advance fascism in the United States. And I think it's time we take a 
serious, very serious, heavy look at how we regulate these utilities. And that's why it matters. Yeah, I mean, yes. Uh, also, we need to start regulating some other stuff, like uh, the internet and social media, so that it doesn't uh, end up just being a, a way to weaponize people. Um, and, you know, these things are, uh, look, the Russians are, are hacking into our fucking power grid. We have neo-Nazis, like, firing, you know, high-powered weapons into transformers to shut down entire, you know, towns. Um, our, our basic infrastructure is, is under attack. And the reason is because we're on defense. Not only should we be shoring up these the, and cleaning up these uh, re these uh, utilities, we should be creating more. Call me a socialist if you want. I don't give a shit. I, what I want is a safe place for my grandkids to grow up. It's that simple. And they can't when the only way to get information is a sewer. And that is why it matters. Well, I would like to say that, uh, you know, we've, we've seen across the United States uh, a couple of different uh, water control systems for towns have been hacked and taken over. Uh, all it would take would be, you know, a manipulation of those systems and you could poison entire cities easily. Uh, our infrastructure is under attack. Uh, the GOP is Putin's fifth column. Um, fascism has come to America. It is attacking us. And until those who are in power, who are tasked with protecting America and protecting the Constitution, get their act together and start doing something, we're going to be stuck in a hellscape. Jim Stewartson's hellscape. Oh, fuck. Look. The country, the world, uh, is is being attacked right now, and it could not be more blatant. And it could not be more dangerous, and it is clearly intended uh, to prevent democracy from continuing forward. Right? Our enemies see two positive potential outcomes for them in 2024. One, they psyop the people and weaponize the system so hard that they manage to get Donald Trump or Mike Flynn or some other fucking functionary uh, of the Russian government uh, in the White House, right? Or, as Mike Flynn and many others are repeating over and over ooh maybe there maybe there won't be a 2024 election to say it out loud all fucking day um pardon me elections are the point right elections voting is the point. They are attacking American citizens' ability to vote based on the information that goes into their brains. Because the information that goes into their brains is fucking poison. Because all day long, every single day, American citizens are being exposed to Kremlin-backed psychological warfare all day. I monitor this shit all day long. And the blatant rise of violent, disgusting videos and Pizzagate and QAnon and dead Gazan babies and dead Israeli babies. What's happening right now? What are they trying to do? 
They are trying to radicalize us into a conflict. They want us to circle into a firing squad. We're going to circle the wagons around whatever, whatever twisted version of America has been programmed into our minds, and we're going to just fucking shoot each other. And who's going to be left over watching and laughing and, and taking our shit? These fucking oligarchs and fascists and billionaires who are intentionally attacking us with information, with, with psyops. We have got to get used to this fucking idea. Because it happens all day long. I, all you have to do is look. Why is the left being painted as pro-Hamas? Why, why all of a sudden is, is the, the desire to not see tens of thousands of, of dead civilians suddenly pro-Hamas? Why is it that wanting to protect Israelis and Jews is suddenly equated with murdering Muslims? Because Israel has a fascist in charge. They have Donald Trump in charge, a puppet the same way as we had for four fucking years. All of these guys, and I have laid them out. Putin, Netanyahu, Flynn, Prince, Roger Stone, Steve Bannon, Elon Musk, Peter fucking Thiel. They are just wandering around freely, openly, attacking civilians with military psychological warfare. It's, it's written down all over the place. Flynn made a white paper about it. How do you radicalize and destabilize a government with spiritual warfare, with religious extremism, with bigotry, with fantasies about child trafficking, about how the infidel is coming to, to rape your kids? It is not a coincidence that the same stories are being created on all sides. Why is that? Why is it that Putin met with Hamas six months before Hamas committed those atrocities? Why is it that Netanyahu had the plans for that attack a year before it happened? It did. Absolutely nothing. Why is it that Christo fascists like Mike Flynn in the United States are cheerleading this? Because we are under attack and they want us to circle up and shoot each other to death. And I am very, very tired of the United States government, including a man I respect, Joe Biden, the military, who are doing nothing about their retired and active colleagues who are actively working against democracy against the United States of America. It's fucking war. They say it. 
We're at war. Mike Lynn said the other day, this is a domestic war in, uh, against the government. And you know who he said it to? Cops. They are trying and in some cases succeeding in turning entire police departments into neo-Nazi QAnon, uh, you know, pre-SS squads. I, I know a cop personally that had to leave because his entire department turned into QAnon. This this is all the same war as Mike Flynn, my my fucking pet fascist who sued me for $50 billion, $50 million, not billion, hope but just give him a week. <laughs> He's the one pushing these uh these fucking narratives. And and his brother, who openly, who created the video call that, that delayed the National Guard for three hours so that people like American hero Akalino Ganel could get traumatized, murdered, maimed by a crowd of fascists. I uh, don't know how else to say it. I have tried to uh, use everything in my power to explain what's happening. Um, and there's nothing from the government, the military, or the press. And that's important. Friends of RadPod will know that we are huge fans of the podcast series Lawyers, Guns, and Money, produced by our friends Jack Bryan and John Cryer. Well, we are bringing you the subject of that podcast series, John Mattis, uh, as our guest today. We're so excited to introduce you to John. He's an Edward R. Murrow award-winning investigative reporter, but it was while he was working as a public defender in Miami that he began this quest to uh, ultimately expose one of the uh, biggest scandals in American history. What he would like you to know mostly about him, though, is he is a survivor. So you raise private funds, you then go off the books, and then you conduct an operation that is wholly outside the framework of government and the law. How is that different than every single thing that happened right up to the insurrection. John Mattis, we are so grateful that you have joined our show for this wonderful episode 77 of Radicalized, Truth Survives. And we are all about truth surviving. And I know that that's been basically your mission in life is for truth to survive uh, as well as our democracy. And I'd love for you to share with our viewers um, some of the thoughts that you and I discussed where lawyers, guns, and money for those of us on the outside is so exciting. It's it's action packed. Yes, it's a true story, but my gosh, it takes us back to sort of Miami Vice and just all the craziness and excitement of the 80s. But for you who lived through it, you described it, you described it as like this five-year slog. Can you kind of give our viewers uh more on what you uh meant by that? Well, again, I look at this saga whatever we want to call it, or a slog, I look at it as a process that I didn't pick. I didn't volunteer to investigate the CIA. No one said, hey, John, I've got an interesting case. Could you spend the next five years immersing yourselves with mercenaries, cartel leaders, and terrorists? That was not in my plan. And so 
as I got slowly drawn in to this process, it was alien to me. Miami, Florida was very alien to me. I'm from Wisconsin. I go to fish fries on a Friday. I don't go to a terrorist meeting in the Everglades on my Fridays. I sort of try to have a very rational world. So the world I got drawn into was a world that was not of my choosing. And slowly over time, I got sucked in to the point I couldn't get out. And it was a day to day, right. day in, day out, the war went on. Day in, day out, there were arms shipments. Day in, day out, there was a cover-up. And sadly, day in, day out, people died. Right. And yep. so that was a process for me. Now, I can look back on it. And Jack is a phenomenal storyteller and has put together an arc of history that I would never have thought of uh, again I'm not a person that goes into a case and tries to think of the arc of history where it may be, but that's what Jack has been able to do with looking at this and looking at the implications. The implications, and you'll hear it in episode seven, are that unless people are watching, they're going to get away with murder. Right. They're going to steal everything. Right. If we depend on people to self-police themselves and you leave them with our money, with no supervision, and you give them weapons, the rogue elements, whether they're in the CIA, whether they're in the DIA, are going to go off the map. And that's the takeaway. The right. takeaway is that what happened in the 80s, we survived only because some of us tried to speak out only because people said, no, you're not gonna bomb harbors of a country we have no interest in. Um, so the takeaway is the system can work, but it's up to all of us to step up and say, hold on, this is our system. This is our tax dollars. You work for us and you're gonna be honest with us. And we're not going to let you walk off with tax dollars and weapons and think you can start a war in plain sight and get away with it. The absurdity of asking me and the public who lived in Miami, Florida, who saw the camo planes leaving full of weapons, full of cannons going, there's no war here. And that's what they would have us believe. And that's what they have us believe today. Correct. Really, when you think about our Justice Department, what you think about what they were selling us in the fall of election disinformation would be the polite word. Um, it's fraud on the American people. And nothing changes unless people speak out and it's like the old nursery rhyme. The king has no clothes. It's a that's, bad joke. That's beautiful. Now, we are going to have a robust chat on so many <laughs> uh, nodes of this incredible story, which is affecting all of us right now in 2023, heading into 2024. But I think it's very important for those who may not know that the reason that you had that stick with itness goes back to your Wisconsin roots. A lot of people may not know that you were a part of a group of young people that actually uh, got involved in Wisconsin politics reluctantly or not to make important changes that actually paved the way for somebody like Tammy Baldwin to become a US Senator. Can you give our uh, friends here a little bit uh, of a snapshot of that period? Because I think that really is the foundation to why you have not only continued to, you know, do incredible things with your career, but why you never backed down. Well, in I came to Madison, Wisconsin in the era of the Vietnam War. 
People were in the streets. People were trying to make a difference. And the local government turned around as many did. I was in Chicago in 68. Many local governments turned around, repressively sought to marginalize the student power and the student votes. We were the majority of the city of Madison, Wisconsin, yet we had no power. Yet the police would routinely go through student neighborhoods, throwing tear gas <laughs> at student apartments. They didn't do that in the rich suburbs, I guarantee it. So a number of us were indignant that the local authorities thought they could get away with it. And there was a student movement and we started talking and I was one who I began on a political level of actually using student resources, i.e. our student government to fund an organization statewide to create a voting power for students. And once we, once too many of us were tear gassed, too many of us were beaten up by the police, we said, wait a minute. And it took a couple brave radicals, I'll call them, whatever you want to call them, to actually run for office. And our first victory was Paul Soglin, who became the mayor. And so in that environment, I was encouraged um, with a beer bet um, to run for office. Uh, we were so out, oh, we were so outraged that the county government did a car day. Think about that, uh, an appreciation of the automobile. And <laughs> if that wasn't enough to get me to run for office, there was nothing. Anyway, I ran and I won. And then I subsequently ran for city council and won. And then we emerged as the majority. And we woke up one day and said, wait a minute, we got to govern this city. How do wow. we do it? Wow. And we would go in every day looking for the most innovative ideas anywhere in the country to implement. And the very first thing we did was we doubled the tax on tourists coming to the city. The conventioneers, the rotary clubs, the bankers, they ought to pay their fair share. They're coming to our city to enjoy our lakes, our natural resources. You pay your fair share by doubling the taxes we became a triple A rated bonded city with money flowing in at incredibly low rates to do capital projects. So we set out to rebuild the city physically and socially. We set out to provide elderly people transportation. We set out to provide women who are afraid of sexual assault free transit at night. We set out to police the alcohol abuse that existed in the city. And we set out to clean the phys physical aspects of the city in the winter. One of the most basic things we did was assure our elderly residents that they would not freeze to death on our sidewalks. Something really fundamental, and it touches me. Wow. <laughs> we, we were confronted with a city controlled by absentee landlords and big money interests who let the city become an ice bound abyss for people trying to walk around in the middle of the winter because they never shoveled their sidewalks. Simple thing. But if you're an elderly person or a student trying to get to class, you had to climb over. Anyway, we said absentee landlords, guess what? We're going to triple the fines for people who don't shovel their sidewalks. And more importantly, we're going to go to every absentee landlord. If your sidewalk isn't clean for our constituents, we are going to bring a city crew at hundreds of dollars an hour and do it for you. And it is showing that kind of support to the people that live there. And it was really fundamental. 
it was fundamental to provide a transit service for women who are afraid of sexual assault. It was fundamental to provide funding for our tenants union. And it was fundamental for us when we didn't have a cab company because they had bankrupted themselves to start our own city run union cab. We sought to not only build the city, rebuild it physically, but socially to make it a place that people could live and prosper. It's very inspiring to hear that because it's that can do ness that we absolutely need now. People are too often obeying in advance because they see so much negative uh, shit out there and they think they can't do anything about it. And that's just not true. And that's not your story. So I want to know if John's going to run. That's all. That's what <laughs> yeah, <I wanna> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, uh, I was a kid. I ran as a kid. Yeah. I, I know. I ran in a different environment. And the, yeah, very. <laughs> and the to get elected, it's all about knocking on doors and meeting people. Yeah. And for us, it was reaching out to a constituency that didn't vote, didn't want to vote. How do we address them? Well, we addressed it actually by providing going where they were to the bars. Oh. We had matchbooks. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of matchbooks <laughs> provided. If you needed to smoke, whatever you were smoking, in a bar, you would get our matches. <laughs> um, we approached finding our voters where they were. And that's what um, it took. Um, now, the political forces tried to turn and move the dates of the primary elections for students in the middle of spring break. We had to then mobilize an entire city of students to absentee ballots. Wow. And we did it. Wow. The Republicans kept trying to roll it back. Sounds familiar, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it does. It does. Yeah. And, and we had to just step up and say, okay, you're not going to let us vote? Good. We'll, we'll turn in 100,000 absentee ballots. Incredible. And that's what it took. Mm -hmm. And so the takeaway is we can make a difference. We can impact the lives of our friends and neighbors and really do something transformative if we all get together and say, it's our, whether right. it's our city, whether it's our state, or whether it's our country. That's right. And that's why I wanted to start there, because we now have had our heart warmed with this beautiful story about people who came together to help their communities. And now we're going to get into the gnarly meat of our interview, which is you just finding yourself inadvertently at the center of uh, pulling one of the first threads in revealing one of our nation's uh, biggest scandals. And honestly, there's a few events in our history, in my lifetime, that I look at as uh, the reason that we are still on such a precipice of losing our democracy again today. And it is high level people getting away with secretive, corrupt deals. And why don't you tell our viewers um, kind of how you sort of shockingly found yourself at the center of Iran Contra? Uh you don't sign up for a red contract. Uh, you're drafted into it, whether you know it or not. I didn't know in the summer of 1985 when I was sitting in intake court um, as a first time lawyer, I think I had been sworn in two months before I had handled a couple of misdemeanors. So I got to go to felony court and I put on my great suit and uh, was sitting down there and you're handing out files because we were in the middle of the drug wars. And there are 30, 40 people sitting in the docket who are being arraigned for something. And they handed me a file. And I went over and introduced myself to the gentleman and said, you've been arrested for a machine gun, a silencer, and you had the serial numbers filed off. And he said, don't worry. It was just, it was as blasé, as relaxed as <laughs> I didn't quite process it. Um, 
And it's when the individual bonded out and came to my office and said, don't worry, I'm part of something much bigger. And frankly, when he told me, of course I knew about it because it was in the paper. <laughs> the, the training camps were in the Everglades for years. Um, so the anti-Fidel sentiment became the anti-Contra sentiment. And Jack, in the episodes, delineates how that thread was used from the Bay of Pigs to the present and how you involved a Miami community of Cuban-American people who believe so strongly. You unleash them. You train them. Remember. The CIA involved and itself with tens of thousands of Miami Cubans. They employed them. They gave them boats. Yeah. They gave them, they trained them. Well, they didn't train them in life-saving at the YMCA. They trained them in explosives. They trained them in sabotage. They trained them in terrorism. And then once the political wave of, wait a minute, they all got caught, the supervisors all left Miami with the infrastructure of a group capable of carrying out guerrilla paramilitary operations. It left them there on their own. Well, the drug traffickers found them and employed them. Um, so in 1985, I was presented by a client that he was part of a protected network. And the network was freely shipping arms to Nicaragua. Well, it's in the middle of the, the Bolin Amendment. It was simply 100% illegal. illegal. Over and above the Bolin Amendment, you can't load cannons at a public airport during the daylight and crates of ammunition and ship it without supervision, adult supervision. A supervision by the agencies that monitor, we're not supposed to ship high explosives. And the one of the more ironic things was during my investigation, because it was so well known, I came across an FBI file that the FBI had been tracking one group of Cuban freedom fighters into Central America. They weren't shipping explosives in a cargo area as a plane, they were carrying cases of dynamite on commercial aircraft. Excuse me, could you help me get my case of dynamite into the uh, passenger bin? That was acknowledged and talked about with the FBI agents. Now, what's your response if you're an FBI agent you hear, the guy's having problems getting his cases of dynamite on his commercial flight. You might think you might want to take a step to perhaps protect the flying public. Nothing was done. The Miami I operated in was a Miami where people who believed in dialogue with Fidel Castro, they had their cars blown up, they had their businesses blown up and they were targeted and assassinated. So this is the environment where a person tells me he's working shipping guns in the middle of a war. And that was the start. And the very first start was me sitting in my dark little confined office at the Federal Defenders. I worked in the courthouse. I was a federal employee. I picked up a phone paid for by the US government and I called the number and it answered Colonel Douglas Menarchik's office, National Security Council. That was it. The client had just pulled me into the White House like that. I, it was instant. And that was the trigger for five years of myself and others trying to peel away the layers. 
trying to make sense of how can elements of the United States government traffic in arms at the same time we're at peace. At the same time, there is no war. Right. Right. It was right in front of my face. So I know the guys are going to jump in and ask questions. I've got one more question because this is we, we're going to assume most of our viewers will have already um, listened to the series because we have been hyping it for weeks now. But as you're going through this web and all these incredible characters coming in and out and the carry investigation and the 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 obfuscation and all of all of the crazy things that are happening, the danger, uh, the danger to your own life. Was there a moment where you finally were like, ah, the story's going to break. It's going to be fine. It's going to be OK. Everybody in America is going to know. And, uh, you know, we'll all live happily ever after. There was that moment. I don't think it ended up that way, though. Um, the happily ever after, we, as soon as I started the case, I failed in trial with the client. And I said to him, I'm not going to give up. I am going to put forth what you tell me and put it out there and so that you can get some mitigation. So I began an investigation with Senator Kerry's office. We traveled meeting mercenaries that were running this war. Yeah. And two of the mercenaries gave us, oh, we did happen. We had to go to Costa Rica and convince a prison jefe to let us interview two mercenaries who were charged with terrorism. And there we were in this dirty third world prison interviewing to people who gave us the whole elements of the crime. The crime is you're running a secret war, someone's paying for it. Well, we had found the operators, we had found the people actually delivering the weapons, actually going into Nicaragua in combat. We found them. So the question is, who are the puppet masters? Who are running this show? Who were sending arms out of a public airport in Miami, Florida during the daylight and landing at a military airport in Salvador and then transshipping those weapons onto jungle airstrips controlled by the CIA. Pure and simple. It was pretty straightforward in my face. But the question was, who's paying? And the two mercenaries were able to identify someone they called the courier who was coming from Washington once a month with a suitcase full of cash. I don't think the guy even took off his Brooks Brothers suit. He goes to the White House, he fills the briefcase up, and he gets on a commercial flight in Dulles and flies <laughs> to San Jose with a bulky suitcase full of small bills that he's paying the mercenaries to run the war. They knew his name. This was so clownish that the characters used their real names. His name was Rob Owen. He was a tall blonde guy. And they thought I looked like him. They said, you're the preppy guy like him. And I was like, uh -uh, wearing my Brooks Brothers shirt, I guess I gave it away. Um, it was so straightforward. So in answer to your question, there was that moment. The whole thing was laid out. We had the operators. We had the physical dates of the departures of weapons flights. We knew where they went. Now we knew who controlled it and paid for it. So it was a simple question of, of, well, what do we do with it? Well, being a good citizen, I went to the FBI. I said to the FBI, I need to talk. Let's talk about something going on literally blocks from the FBI headquarters at the airport. And I met with them. I was taken into a, a room full of FBI anti-terrorism agents and got in a two-hour shouting match with them, trying to convince them that there was a war outside their door. Now, not really, shouldn't have been difficult. I got the players in Costa Rica. They're not going anywhere. You got the arms shipments and you got the person who flies every month. Why don't you just check his airline records or call him up? Anyway, 
The FBI didn't want to hear a word of it. And I laid out chapter and verse, A to Z, all of the characters, all of the mechanical aspects of the armed shipments, laid it out to them. And after two hours, I was convinced they didn't want to hear it. I mean, they shouted me down when you're trying to provide information regarding a war. Wow. And the most telling thing was as I'm walking out, the agent said, well, okay, I, it was nice seeing you. And I have to finish up the report on you, John. Washington wants it today. That was six o'clock on a March 13th, 1986. Years later, I got a copy of that memorandum that they wrote. It was written to the assistant director of the FBI. That report went to Lowell Jensen, assistant attorney general, others in the administration, and most importantly, it went over to the White House to John Poindexter. They knew that I had divulged the whole thing. And when I saw the memorandum years later, it was chilling because he truthfully wrote everything I had laid out. He truthfully wrote the name of the courier. He truthfully wrote where the money came from, how it was transferred. And he, oh yes, he mentioned the narcotics traffickers that I named, named. I didn't give nicknames. I named who they were. I knew them. So, oh, those same traffickers that same week, oh, they got their humanitarian aid checks. Mm -hmm. The State <laughs> Department, the very people that the assistant director of the FBI and John Poindexter had written down the names of, and their companies, Ocean Hunter Seafood, Punta Reina, de Figueroa, I was naming them at the same time they were getting checks cut to them by the State Department for a quarter million dollars a pop to take care of the freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. The whole thing. So March 13th, 1986, immediately triggered a massive cover-up a massive retaliatory campaign against me and the whistleblowers. And they wiped the war off the face of the American narrative. The front page of the Washington Post, the Justice Department said there was no war. What am I to do? I'm a, I'm a public defender sitting in an office in Miami, Florida, and the guy said, there's no war outside. Okay, maybe it'll snow in Miami. Gentlemen, so, I, I, go, go, go. So, so what you experienced from the American government was information warfare. They were trying to change public perception of reality <clears throat> to make it look like you didn't exist, you didn't matter, what you said was nothing. How do you react to that? What, what does that make you feel? <laughs> um. I was living in a different universe. I'm working in the federal courthouse. Down the street, the US attorney is saying none of this happened. The FBI is saying none of it happened. I see all of those people every day. It was as if I was a zombie night of the, uh, it was an out of body experience because reality, truth was that there was no war. Yet everybody in Miami knew it. I mean, it was like the king has no clothes. Yeah. And it was gut-wrenching because how do I say reality is a little different? I mean, it's, it, well, it's confronting. Let's look at January 6th. Let's look at, they were just walking as tourists through the building. Now, our eyes don't lie. We saw it, we experienced it, but we are told that it doesn't exist. And that's the disinformation campaign that starts, well, it starts 
as far back in American history as you go. But let's look at the current context of how do you get away with it? Well, you just say it enough times, maybe people believe it. I mean, that's the chilling thing. Um, we all grew up with 1984, and we think that's fiction. Is it? No, it's really not fiction. Um, I I have so many questions, but I wanted to focus on one person in particular who I feel like sits in the middle of everything we've talked about here, uh, a guy named Jack Singlob. Um, and Jack Singlob is a fascinating character. And rather than me talk about him, I'd love to just hear from you um, what you've learned about him. Part of the, the reason I, I bring Jack Singlob up is that he remains incredibly, um, even though he died a few, little while ago, um, his legacy lives on. Uh, Singlob had a, a, as you probably know, a nonprofit called America's Future that he founded in 1946 after World War II, presumably because he didn't really like the way it went. <laughs> he wanted to, he, he wanted a different, uh, uh, you know, an anti-communist uh, place. Anyway, turns out Mike Flynn, somebody else that I'm sure you're familiar of, with, um, took over America's future and is now running, and this is the crazy part, Pizzagate, uh, psychological operations out of Jack Singlob's nonprofit. So he's got a bunch of literally, you know, Pizzagate, QAnon, psychological warfare, like propagandists running out of Singlob's nonprofit to peddle child trafficking propaganda to a bunch of American citizens. And, here, and I will land my plane and just I'd love to get your impressions. He's um, running. He's running these operations in guess where swing states, Michigan, Ohio, Minnesota. So I feel like there is a there there is a, a parallel speaking of parallels between some of the operations that took place in, say, Central America, where people were being radicalized, you know, on purpose um and now in in some of the same literal organizations that you know we're we're helping to run those operations um you're you've got the 2023 version uh running as well so sorry for that long ish question but i i with that as context i wanted to hear uh you know your impressions of singlob and how he fit into the whole iran contra affair he never stepped out of the shadows. He's always operated in the shadows. And yeah. let me take you through a rencontre. He was there in the shadows. He right. was there with the network. He was behind the scene. He was there with the militias, for sure. Um, and the militias were critical to this. Um, Singlob has been around operating in those, these theaters for decades. Now, let me narrow focus. Jack Singlob is a traitor, a treasonous traitor. Subsequent to this saga, I represent, I represented an entire army of CIA agents that were left behind in North Vietnam to perish and languish. He made the decision to desert his own troops, to leave them rotting in death camps for 20 years because he knew that he had operated in illegal war, a combat operations in North Vietnam prior to the Gulf of Tonkin. He left that army 
to wither and die in POW camps, knowing. And then most egregiously, as the senior commander of a covert operation that employed hundreds of Vietnamese commandos in North Vietnam, he killed them on paper so that they would never be brought home. He left them to die. We confronted him, myself and the Vietnamese commandos who survived at a live testimony of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And the very men that he sent to, to perish and to languish for 20 years said to the United States senators, there's a man sitting here we cannot respect. And they physically turned their backs on him at the witness table in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The man is a traitor. The man did what any military commander would have been court-martialed for. So when we talk about Mike Flynn running a scam, scam as much as anything, he's doing fundraising. How much is he living off the, the high life of the people that actually believe in whatever disinformation? So Sing Long's fingerprints I run across too often in my life. Uh, I never thought I would sit personally in a live hearing in front of the city, in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and have my clients call him a traitor. They did. Yeah, I mean, Singlov is is one of the most unbroken strings <laughs> of rat fucking in uh, in his recorded history i mean it's and all of his anti-communist stuff in the 60s um the western goals i mean he's just a, a racist like um you know white supremacist who's who you know has just been run, ran illegal operations for decades um for criminals yes. um and you know to have uh a guy who's suing me and others for 50 million dollars uh sitting in singlob's fucking uh nonprofit from 1946 running and by the way yes he's raising money from this um but this is russian propaganda so so pizzagate came from literally kremlin hacked emails from podesta so he's recycling kremlin psyops uh to to you know brainwash people in swing states so it's more than yes it's fundraising and there's a very important component of this but what he's doing is running active measures he's running you know influence operations it's whatever you want to call it but he's doing it inside of the united states um and that that's why for me you know i'm so focused on this guy is because He's taking a lot of Singlob's operations, a lot of those same ideas, how they radicalize the Contras and radicalize both sides in Central America. Uh, Flynn's basically just taking those ideas here. One of the things you're going to find, because I spent too many years investigating charity fraud, it's there. there is skimming going on while he's putting out the Russian disinformation. He's taken the nice dinners. Oh, Mike, hell yeah. <laughs> and that is going to be his vulnerable place because those records become records of every state where he's doing the fundraising and, the, and that his supporters slash victims are going to realize how much was going into the pockets of all of the people around him to do whatever else they're doing. I mean, right. the problem with keeping on top of these people is they're multifaceted con men and terrorists. They operate in a variety of theaters. Wow. We're, uh, we're going to talk about pardon fraud too. Thank you so much, both Jim and John, for that. Um, I just want to get to the heart of something uh, right now. We talked about militias. Episode seven is so 
freaking explosive because that is where we learn the same network running illegal wars to fight communism is now fighting us by funding and plotting and organizing the January 6th insurrection, which means this network now is fighting to overthrow our democracy using militias run by traitorous generals. And can we please tell our viewers why these things that occur in the past, such as pardons for people who are running criminal operations in our country at the highest levels, still are scarring us and threatening us today. What we have with the militia movement, and it, it goes back, I mean, whether it's Timothy McVeigh or going back into the eras that I confronted the multiple militias who were recruited for the war fighting in an illegal war. Those militias were sanctioned. Those militias were surveilled is the wrong word, handled by the FBI, handled. They weren't stopped. No one ever said to the Frank Camper or any of the mercenaries training camps, hey, maybe this is illegal. <laughs> this is part and parcel of elements of the United States government, whether it's the FBI, et cetera, sanction. So it goes down to case agents, FBI agents, alcohol, ATF agents, are told, hey, keep track of this group in Alabama or take, keep track of the group in Florida, whether you're the January 6th or whether you're training mercenaries for Nicaragua. Nothing changes. You put handlers on it. You monitor it so that nothing goes off the ranch. And literally, you have a cutout group who can do your bidding. And look what happened with January 6th, when we had trained militia marching up the stairs. That didn't just happen by coincidence. Everybody knew. And I think that further investigation, just as the same thing when I found out that historically the FBI did nothing when people load cases of dynamite on commercial aircraft. The FBI monitors these things, makes sure they're going within the parameters of what the rogue element of the FBI is looking for, and it's completely cut out so that when you have the militias caught in January 6th, they have to pay the price. Remember, in Iran-Contra, the only people prosecuted for invading Nicaragua we're a bunch of hapless mercenaries yes. from Decatur, Alabama, who are probably drinking moonshine. I'm that sorry. That sounds familiar. That sounds <laughs> That's real. Familiar. That sounds so fucking familiar. The foot familiar. soldiers, man. The foot yeah. soldiers. Enrique Torres and his yeah. ship of fools yes. that went to do the bidding of the, you know, where is Stone? Where are some of the, the real people? that were hands on, oh, wait, we missed them. Um, we're Mike Flynn. I, yeah. I, just so you know, I, I sent the FBI information weeks ahead of time, mm -hmm. told them and put it on Twitter with viral threads saying, here's literally what's going to happen. It's going to be Flynn and Stone and a bunch of Proud Boys and a bunch of QAnon people in front of the Capitol, and people are going to fucking die. And I said that to the FBI multiple times. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. Jack shit happened. And and the guy still in charge, Chris Ray, is still trying to gaslight us that there was no way he could have fucking known. Excuse me. Uh, that 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 That's a lie. And, um, you know, so forgive me for, for, but, but this, it just raises a lot of these same exact alarm bells that I'm seeing right now, which is a complicit part. And I'm not saying all FBI agents are dirty at all, but there is a part in my opinion, not just my opinion, they've been indicting some of them 
uh, part of the FBI that, that has been compromised for a long time and has been covering up, um, you know, starting in Iran Contra and then going today, and forgive me, I'll land my plane here. Bill Barr, by the way, speaking of another fucking character who constantly <laughs> comes up in these things, Bill Barr is the guy who let off Roger Stone and Mike Flip. No, it, it the process goes on. And I think in episode seven, my takeaway was that until we have institutional oversight, until we have yeah. uh, people that are not persecuted and prosecuted for standing up, we will continue to allow rogue elements of our governments and our institutions in the government. With January 6th, we saw elements of the Justice Department that were righteous, that tried to do the right thing. And guaranteed there were a lot of agents that tried to do the right thing, but the rogue elements that had centralized the power were able to use it the same way they were able to use other elements of the government, whether or not they had to have people at the Pentagon, whether or not they had to have people all along chains of command. They didn't control our institutions. They just had enough in entrance points to corrupt them. And so the corruption of what happened with January 6th is we enabled, we empowered militias to serve the purpose of elements of our government. And they did it, and they did it effectively. And then they were thrown out just like dirty tissue. Yeah. Um, and the Enrique Tarrio and his ship of fools, the followers that walked over that gangplank for Roger Stone, who sat and gleefully watched it happen. And they were all played. They were all literally victims of a disinformation campaign that brought them in, that radicalized them, and turned them into zombie foot soldiers for the people who were trying to overthrow our government. I don't think any of those soldiers had a sense that they wanted to overthrow democracy. They didn't think that. All they thought they were doing was following their leader on a quest for truth, justice in the American way. And guess what? They were all done. And they all sit wondering. I've represented mercenaries. I represent the whistleblowers. I would stand with any of them right now and say they were exploited. They literally just <laughs> thrown away. And that's what these elements always do. They always throw away the foot shoulders. And then if a whistleblower comes along, look out. And this is a process we see time and time again. Ask the Watergate burglars who stood up for them. <laughs> no one, nothing changes. They left an army in death camps in Vietnam because it was inconvenient. They, what is going on with January 6th and the Mike Flynn's and those organizations is they are fading because they've seen the heat and they're operating behind, behind the really the, the fallout and the fallout is the people that were there on those steps. I mean, how many knew what they were supposed to do when they walked inside the Capitol? I, literally. They're like, ah, we're here. Uh, what, you know, what the fuck? What do we do now? Yeah, I guess I mean, take a shit on the floor and steal Nancy Pelosi's laptop. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, literally, I think of Pickett's charge at Gettysburg. Hi, guys, send a 5,000 over there to get killed immediately. I was like, Oh, really? And right, they were revved up and sent up there. And 
the arrogance? I would argue that some of those people in that crowd had missions and they were intent on murdering politicians yeah. if they caught them. There were there were the sneaky little groups, right? The militias inside the crowd and they had missions. The people with the, the zip ties, yes. the people yes. who were, they were hunting, yes. right? Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of the crowd, they were just, hey, we're taking over the Capitol, woohoo. Let's smoke a joint. I mean, they were the idiot foot soldiers. They were the smoke and the mirrors, the confusion for the more insidious violence that was attempting to worm its way through that day. Ashley Babbitt thought she was saving the children. Yes. No, it, it disturbed. And again, she's a perfect example of a disturbed person who had been on the margins of her own existence of her margins of her life in San Diego, and she fell victim. Yeah. And then there were the psychos, the small, small group of psychos who actually thought they could commit the kind of terrorism and get away with it because they believed that they would be protected. They wow. always have that same delusion wow whether it's loading guns in 1985 to help the freedom fighters or you're going in with zip ties, the psychos are empowered. And who is who's calling the puppet masters out? That's the thing. I mean, it is the people that are behind it and that run from operation to operation, scheme to scheme, war to war. Um, it's ongoing. If I go back to episode seven of the podcast, I think of, yes, we can make a difference, but it is not easy treading. I mean, it, um, but what the hell do we have to lose? We have to lose a lot. We have to lose everything. Because people think they can get away with it. I mean, when you think about it, January 6th, Eastman thinking he could get away with it? Where did, what was he smoking? I know what I smoked. I don't know what he was smoking. Well, guess who was the final sign-off on the Eastman memo? Who, who, who? whose lawyer from Afghanistan started the Eastman memo, Mike Flynn is the guy who said, oh, there's a typo there, but otherwise we're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> it's oh, it's the same people doing the same shit over mm -hmm. and over again. But I, I would actually like to talk about the projection because if one of the things that QAnon talks about is they talk about they're fighting the deep state, right? <laughs> but if we look back at this history, we look at Singlaw leaving agents to die in Vietnam when he was in the OSS. We look at the Carter uh, October surprise, right? That was, that was government agents pulling some bullshit. If we look at Watergate. Bill Casey, that's, man, that's another one, by the way. Yeah, Bill Casey. I mean, what we are looking at, these corrupted elements inside our government, the deep state exists. It's just <laughs> not who they're telling you it is. <laughs> it's a house of cards. Yeah. Uh, they're always moving, and they're moving their names and their organizations around. Though, going back to the fundamental takeaway of episode seven. We have institutions that because we're a democracy, you can get in and corrupt them. You can get in and take a section of the CIA. You can take a section of the FBI, the State Department, the Justice Department, and you get your friends in. And think about the Trump years. Yeah. It was all about putting people in play that could control institutions whether you were at the department of the EPA, you were at the interior department, he placed people 
who he could call upon not to do to for specific operations and they existed there and some of them were used some of them weren't but that we look at institutions in the government time in time out that there are elements that get away with it and i mean i wake up in the morning and go yeah you almost got away with it um they almost got away with January 6th, almost, almost. I mean, how close? What if Donald Trump had said to the fools in that December meeting, yeah, make him attorney general for a day or just, and make him chief of the staff to the, the Pentagon. We were so close that one person, and it took people in that room saying, we're going to get everyone in the Justice Department to resign. We are conservatives. We believe in the Trump doctrines, but we're not going to let you pull off a coup. And it took people in that room to scream the same way I felt I was screaming at the FBI to say, don't go there. You can't. And it was that those moments that we can look and say, there's still decent people in the institution of government that go to work. And that's what's such a threat to the Trumps. That's why they're looking at a plan when they take over to purge the civil servants, to purge those people that protect our institutions day in, day out that show up in the morning that are, you know, they're stuck in their federal work, but they do it every day. Um, one of the key things, I was tolerated. I mean, I was allowed to work for the federal government. At the same time, I was uncovering a criminal conspiracy by the very people a couple offices over from me. Um, I survived. There are people inside government every day that do the righteous thing for us. We got to find them, we got to empower them, and we got to say, you are the future. Not the scumbags that come in and try to exploit the basic human nature of trying to do good in government. Um, I very strongly believe that we all have a role to play. And we could all sit on the sidelines and eat our popcorn, but it really doesn't work. Uh, our institutions are dependent on people speaking up. Mattis would go on to have a successful career as an investigative reporter, winning five Emmys and an Edward R. Murrow Award. When I first met John Mattis, it was spring of 2017, and I was interviewing him for a documentary called Active Measures about Russia's interference in the 2016 election. I was interviewing him because, again in this scandal, Mattis popped up. Mattis, who now lives in San Diego, was a volunteer for the Bernie Sanders campaign who noticed a massive amount of Russian disinformation appearing on pro-Bernie Sanders Facebook pages once Bernie Sanders was out of the race. So when Senator Sanders said this, Turns out that uh, one of our social media guys in, in San Diego uh, actually went to the Clinton campaign in September right. and said something weird is going on. He was talking about Mattis. And again, Mattis connected with Jonathan Weiner. And Weiner himself was an important part of exposing that scandal as well. In fact, by the time I met Mattis, I had already interviewed Weiner for that same documentary without knowing the two men had ever met. And so that floating crap game that Weiner was talking about doesn't just attract the same players. Sometimes it also attracts the same investigators. And Mattis is still at it to this day. Well, the beauty of what I learned is you can be a nobody and do something. You can be totally without any title, without any power. But if you take the time and you put the energy in, you're gonna be able to do something about it. And 
I'm a firm believer in the squeaky wheel. I don't care whether you're a citizen sitting at home, seeing something that doesn't fit, call it out. That's the easiest thing in the world to do is to speak up, stand up and call it out. And that's what I tried to do. And if you don't do it, you're back sitting with everybody else watching it pass by in history. <laughs>